I'm getting asked a lot right now, Ty, how do I study for my EPA six weight certification test? And if you've been following this series from the very beginning, you're ready for this. You understand the refrigeration cycle, you understand vacuum, recovery, recharge, basic leak search. Now's the best time to really buckle down and study for that test. Your next step should be finding a testing location and setting a date. Now there's many different testing locations. You can go to your local supply house, HVAC wholesaler. Many of those do testing. You could also look at ESCO's website. They have different testing locations. They even have remote testing and also Faraday Careers. Faraday Careers has instructors online, instructors ready to work with people, and they do remote testing for EPA six weight certification. But find one of those locations and lock yourself a date. Get a date set. Maybe it's two weeks, maybe it's three weeks, maybe at the most four weeks away, but lock that date in right now because now you have a deadline to work for. If you don't have that deadline set, I see too many times where people keep pushing that off. Even schools that are two years long, they'll wait till the very last to do it and then they're, they're stressed out having to take the test and they have to have that certification before they get their job. So go ahead and set that deadline now. If you're a procrastinator, that's okay. If you have a deadline set three weeks from now and it's three days before the test, hey, you're going to be studying major. But that's okay. Make sure you have that deadline now. So schedule it in, get it in a place. Next thing, I'll start studying for it. I'm not going to make a series devoted to the EPA 608 test because it's the one course I hated teaching. Lots of regulations, laws, rules, and I don't necessarily agree with all of them, but we have to teach it. The cool thing is my friend Brian Orr at HVAC school has already done all of this prep work. He has an entire playlist just for EPA 608 certification. Core, type one, type two, type three, everything you're gonna need. I'm gonna put a link to his video set in the description below so you can go through that. You can see it, you can hear it at the same time. Great way to study. Another great way is ESCO has a study guide. It's a written manual you can go through. It has all the information, really down to earth, easy to understand information, but it's still very technical. I've had students that took that certification, read through it, passed the test. The majority of my students don't work that way. I don't learn that way. However, if you combine that study guide and follow through that study guide as you're going through Brian's videos, that would be powerful. Now you're hearing him talk, you're seeing him with the PowerPoints. You're also able to highlight and make notes through the study guide because they actually work together in order. That is something that's more, much more powerful. Now you're actually writing this stuff down and it helps you learn for the long term. So using those two together, definitely a good idea. Now, one of the tricks I found my students used that really aced the test, the students I found out that were making the best grades on it, were using an app and the app was called EPA 608 study app. It's a very simple app. It has core type one, type two, and type three, where you can study through all of these test questions. Some of these test questions are word for word, the same exact questions that are on the test. Now there's multiple versions of the test. We can't guarantee it's going to be accurate all the time, but what's really important is it has the questions and the answers that are worded just like they're going to be worded for the actual test. So even if they're not the exact same questions, the wording is key because it helps prepare you of how those questions are going to be worded. So you're now understanding how they word the questions and how to look for that correct answer. Because all those multiple choice tests, they're really about trickery. So being able to practice that way is great. Now, if you use that app, there's two methods. You have the test method and you have the study method. Use the study method. Don't use the test method. The test method doesn't tell you what you got right or wrong. It just says, hey, you got 60%. It doesn't tell you how well you're doing. What you really want to use is the study method because the study method tells you the question and then will show you the correct answer after you guessed. It's important because now you're seeing the question and you're seeing the correct answer. So in your mind, question, correct answer, question, correct answer. And it's training your brain to think a certain way. And you can also use that while you're sitting, waiting for a train, waiting for a bus, while you're sitting on the toilet, during a commercial, whatever it is, you can sit and study just for a few minutes at a time and helps prepare you over and over again. But you have to practice at it. I had a student that downloaded that app, uh, used it maybe twice, and it was complaining that he failed the test. You have to actually use it. No matter what method it is, you're going to have to devote some time to it. But it's one of the methods I've had the best success with. Even if you're not using that exact test, even if some of the questions aren't 100%, the wording is what is key for that whole thing. So you can actually use all those together if you want and really drive it home. But those are some of the best ways I've seen students study and really excel at that test. Now, after you've done all your studying, let's talk about taking that test. Before you take that test, at least two hours before, maybe three or four hours before, stop studying. Just stop altogether. Go to the gym, go for a swim, go for a hike, whatever it is. You need to clear your brain. You need to refresh. Get some fruits and vegetables, some healthy food, uh, plenty of water. Clear your mind. I would even take my students and we'd go run or walk around the building several times to clear everybody's mind out. 
And what happens is students, they do all that cramming, all that work, and then they go to take the test, and they're so stressed out that they can't concentrate on any of the questions because they've really fried their brain too early on. So making sure your mind is clear before that test, I've seen a great success with that. So make sure your mind is clear. When you show up for that test, you'll make sure you have your driver's license, and you're going to have to enter your social security number as identification on that test. Now, some people just use whatever number they want. And I don't care what you use for a number, but I will warn you that you whatever number you use for that social security number, you must know that for the rest of your life because that's how you're going to log back in anytime you lose that card or you have to retake or retest. Whatever number you entered as your social security number at the beginning is the same number you're going to have to enter in again to have access to that test. So whatever number you use, make sure that you have that down and memorize for the rest of your life. But that's how you're gonna log back in. I've had students make that mistake many times. I've also had students that accidentally typed the wrong number. And it is such a pain having to go back through and see if that's fixable, and sometimes it's not fixable. Now, when you take that test, they're gonna give you a blank piece of paper and a temperature and pressure chart. You can't take anything else in, no study guide, no notes, nothing else, only the blank paper and the temperature pressure chart. So as soon as you start the test, what I recommend you do is draw the refrigeration cycle out. Right away, draw it out. Now it has a question. What happens if you have a clogged up metering device? You can look at that picture of the refrigeration cycle. Now you can visualize what's gonna happen. You can take answer A and look and see how that is gonna play. No, that won't work. Answer B, nope, that won't work. Answer C, oh, that seems plausible. Answer D, nope, that didn't fit. So you know the best answer is gonna be answer C. But being able to visualize that refrigeration cycle, that is a great tip. Now on the back side of that paper, before you answer questions, also mind dump any of the dates, any of those charts. When it talks about industrial process refrigeration, when it talks about greater than 200 pounds, less than 200 pounds, any of those little charts, just brain dump those charts on the back of that paper. Any dates before November 15th, 1993, after November 15th, 1993, all those dates, anything you can remember, just dump that information right there in a the paper. Because I've had students before that knew those numbers, but then they're going through all these questions question after question after question, and they start second guessing themselves. But having those numbers right there to refer to definitely is an important trick. I've had students that wrote all that information down and they get to a question on a test and they start really struggling. And it says, before November 15th, they're like, I don't remember this question. I'm like, and I can't tell them, but I'm like, it's right there on the paper. You wrote the notes down, look at your notes. So use those notes through the test. After you brain dump and write them down, use those notes, refer back to it. You have all the dates right there. Next things, make sure you're using the temperature pressure chart that they give you. There's a ton of information on there. But anytime it's talking about a temperature and it gives you a pressure, use a temperature pressure app. Anytime it's talking about a pressure, asking for a temperature, use a temperature pressure app. Use that app. It's a tool that you can use for the test. I wouldn't suit to try to memorize the entire temperature pressure chart. Don't do that. Even it's talking about freezing, which is literally a temperature, 32 degrees. Use that temperature pressure chart and be able to convert it. Another mistake I see students make is not utilizing that temperature pressure chart. It'll say, of these refrigerants, which one is the lowest pressure? And it gives you four different possibilities. So just pick one. Pick A. And we'll go through and just pick a temperature. Let's say 50 degrees. At 50 degrees, see what the pressure is going to be. And then refrigerant B, see what the pressure is going to be. And then refrigerant C, all the way through. And at 50 degrees, which one of those refrigerants they offered you had the lowest pressure? Well, that's a low pressure refrigerant. Same thing with the high pressure refrigerant. Just pick 50 degrees of the options they give you, which one had the highest pressure? Well, there you go. That's the highest pressure refrigerant. Now the ESCO temperature pressure chart also at the top gives you a lot of information that students overlook. A lot of times it'll actually tell you the safety classification. It tells you if it's a CFC, HCFC, uh, HC refrigerant. So it's asking which refrigerant's an HFC refrigerant. Look at your options. And at the top of that ESCO temperature pressure chart, it'll tell you a ton of information. If it's flammable, if it's an A1, A2 refrigerant valuable, valuable information right there in the temperature pressure app that they give you, there's a ton of answers right there. With that information alone, you can do really, really good on that test. But too many times I see students stressing over that question and the answer is right there on that temperature pressure chart and they just never look at it. So look at that chart, take your time, go through, relax, and you'll be surprised at how many answers are right there. Next thing, when you're going through that question, just answer what you know. And if you get confused or stumped on a question, just guess, just Pick one, just go for it. And now you can write it down. Question number 25, put a question mark. I wanna go back to that. Cause you can go back to any one of them. But I see students will be so stumped. They'll spend 20 or 30 minutes on one question alone. I've even spent an hour, an hour on one question. And they fry their brain, they get frustrated, they get irritated, they get mad about this one question. 
now they can't concentrate on the rest of the questions of the test, and then they end up bombing it. So you get to that one question, you looked at the answer four times, man, you know, I don't know, just guess, write down question number 23, I'll go back and look when I get done, and then answer the rest of them. Don't spend too much time on one single question. Another thing you may find is maybe question number 53 actually will have the answer to question number 27. So you can go back and change those questions at any time. It's easy to go back. So once you get done with that test, make sure you go back through and make sure every single question was answered. I had students before that leave them blank. I uh, said, so I don't know the answer. I so, said, well, guess, just pick one. Well, I don't know. I don't know any of the answers. I, I don't care. Pick one. Guess. Any, many, many, you got a one-fourth chance of picking the right question, the right answer. Pick it. Choose it. Don't leave anything blank, even if you just have to randomly guess. Also, when you're looking at these questions, some of the answers, it's like uh, two answers could be correct. Which one is more correct than the other? Or maybe all of them look wrong. Well, which one is less wrong than the other? So that's kind of how to look at it as, well, none of these are really good answers, but this one's probably the less bad of all the answers. And that's the one that you pick. Now, after you get all your questions answered, everything's done, turn it in, grade it. It's okay if you fail it. Don't worry about failing it. So it'll cost you a little bit of money, a little more time to retake it, but it's okay. Retake it as many times as you need, but turn it in. What I see students do is they'll answer all the questions and do good. And then they'll go back through and start second guessing every single question they've already answered. They start second guessing themselves and they change correct answers to wrong answers. I see this all the time. If it's not one of the ones that you put a question mark on that you went back to purposely look at, Leave it be. Question number 13, you think you had it right the first time? It was probably right the first time. You're going back and trying to change it, probably going to change it to the wrong answer most of the time. This is my experience of being a proctor through the years. I see students change the right answer to the wrong answers all the time. But again, turn that test in and it's okay to fail it. You reschedule, pay a little extra money, come back and retake the test and it's no big deal. I have to retake tests over several times. It's okay. I learn from it. I take a little bit longer from it. Maybe it takes me longer than somebody else. Maybe I take it two or three times. It's okay. I know that eventually I'm going to pass it. The cool thing about this test, you only have to retake the sections that you missed. So if you miss type three and type one, you only have to study type one and type three. You don't have to retake core and two again. Now, when you go to retake that test, it's gonna have all of them on there, but you only have to answer the questions of the type that you missed. That's cool. So now you only have to study half as much or a quarter as much of the test. You don't have to study all of it. So as you take that test, you bomb it, it's okay, no big deal. And you know what you need to study. You're gonna buckle down. You're gonna set that date. You're gonna do it again. One mistake I see students make a lot is as soon as they get done with the test, they miss type two by say two questions. And they're like, oh, I wanna retake it. I know which two that I missed. One of the problems I've seen is after a student takes that test and they fail one, even if it's by only one question, they wanna immediately retake it. I wanna retake it right now. I know which one that I missed. It doesn't quite work that way. The failure rate of a student retaking that test right away is extremely high. I've only had two students in all the time that I've taught that were able to pass that test, retaking it immediately after they took it. What we started doing in a lot of the schools is required a 24 hour wait period. So after you failed the test, you had to wait 24 hours before you could take it again. It needs to give you time to clear your mind, time to reset, time to study on just that one section. The other issue is, and a big reason is, it's not gonna be the same test. So if you miss type two by only one question, you retake that test, now you have a whole new 25 questions. So even though you know what question you missed that needed to make you pass, now you have 25 new questions. So the student goes through, tries to retake that test, and now does worse than it the first time, but even worse than that, their ego is shot. They feel really their self-esteem is low. That's what I hate the most. So make sure if you bomb that test, it's okay. Wait 24 hours, study just that section, come back, knock it out of the park. It's okay to come back. It's 24 hours. 24 hours isn't going to kill you in time, but retaking the test right after you failed it, oh, I've seen students just absolutely distraught from that. So make sure you spend time. It's okay that you didn't pass it the first time. Go and study that section. You're going to take it and do great the next time. So just a quick recap, make sure you schedule your test now as quick as possible. I'm gonna put a link in the description for the place you can take a test. Also see Brian Orr's video playlist for the EPA test. I'll put a link in the description for that. The ESCO study guide, I'll put a link in the description for that. And get started, go take that test, start studying for it, and then ace it. 
And as soon as you get that test aced, you're ready to start your career in HVAC. You're ready to land that first job. And start now. Start as an apprenticeship. Start learning while you're still going to school. The faster you get that EPA test, the faster you get that knocked out, the better you're going to be. Remember, you want universal. Even if you may never use type 3, you may never use type 1, you want to pass all those tests. You want to do it now because the test only gets harder as you go through time. Some of the old school people are like, oh, that test is really easy. Yeah, it certainly was 25 years ago. And even 25 years ago, I still failed my very first time I took it. So it's okay to retake that test. And it's definitely harder now than it was 25 years ago. It's okay. Retake it, but also do all of them now. If I can ace this test, I know that you can do it. So go through, get that universal certification, and in the comments, leave me a note saying, I passed my EPA 608. You don't, don't put your grades on there, but say, I passed my EPA universal. Let me know. Let me know if this is helping, and I want to see everybody be successful. And after you get that done, there's a ton more certifications you can get. You can get your 609 motor vehicle certification. That one, you don't have to have a proctor. It's super easy to get. And there's a ton more certifications. I'll make another video on certifications later. But this is the first one. This is the big one. You got to get this one knocked out. But I know you can do it. And I can't wait to see the comments of all the people that got their EPA 608 universal certification. I know you can do it.